Welcome students, teachers, and the generally curious to the 11th episode of the Constitution of American Life with the Friends of Publius. In this segment, we are going to be focusing on one of the favorite topics of Professor Chris Cavanaugh, and that is the design and function of bicameralism and specifically the U.S. Senate. We are very much looking forward to Pro Professor Cavanaugh's thoughts. Uh, this, discussing this topic also allows us to move away from what has been fre so frequently labeled the clown show known as the House of Representatives, which is on its 16th, I believe, or 17th consecutive day without a speaker. Gentlemen, any thoughts? Are, 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 you know, I, 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 real quickly, can they give this speaker pro tem authority? Yes. They can't. That, that would not violate they, constitutional procedures. They would, they'd, have to re, they'd have to reach an agreement to expand his authority because they will. They are able to establish the rules, but as I understand it, the Democrats are probably not willing to do that unless they get something in writing. Uh, so if they get something in writing, they may actually agree to expand his role temporarily so legislation can start moving because right now they're uh, they're a little more constipated than usual. Well, yeah, and uh, it, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, uh, according to my congressman, uh, uh, former Speaker of the House, uh, Kevin McCarthy, it, the Democrats are all to blame for this. All right. We would not be in this mess, according to uh, Congressmember uh, McCarthy, if it weren't for uh, the Democrats. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll get around to caring about the country more than their party uh, there, Professor Kavanaugh. I guess not. No, you're not going to go for that. I'm right. not taking debate, baby. Not, not taking, not taking debate. debate. All right. So, that curveball is going to go right over the plate. And I'm just going to watch it go right by. Oh, well, that's better than the last curveball I threw in my life because that sucker's still circumnavigating the earth uh, as far as I know. <laughs> what, what did Mike say? Should have a, anything that flies that far should have a stewardess? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Bull Durham, I think, uh, one of the great lines uh, there. Uh, so, Going from discussing the House to discussing the Senate may not leave the clown show far behind. Uh, this past week, I have done a lot of reading uh, on Senator Mitt Romney's decision to retire rather than seek re-election in 2024. Although Senator Romney uh, still supports the structure, rules, and traditions of the Senate, he has come to believe that modern politics is unwilling to select candidates with the necessary character traits to carry out the solemn and serious duties of the Senate. According to Senator Romney, only about 20 senators are serious about governing, governing and serving their constituents. That is, about 20 senators do all the work and the other 80 are you know, just uh, there for the, the free meals and, and such. After observing the Senate for weeks, as an anthropologist might observe native cultures, Romney determined that the Senate had become a geriatric home for old men who love free meals, free haircuts, and doctors within 100 feet at all times, and were determined to hold on to their seats, not because they believed in service, but because they wanted the proximity to power, the sense of relevance, and the perks that come with the job. The number one concern of 90% of the U.S. Senate, according to uh, Romney, is to get reelected, not to serve their state or their constituents. I point this out not as an attempt to bring something new to the table, but to bring to light the fundamental question of the purpose, problems, and flaws that the design and function of the Senate might have created for we, the people of the United States. So let's start our discussion here with Professor Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin Center on the Study of the Constitution. Good evening, Professor Moore. We obviously get we obviously get our idea of bicameralism from the British. I, I'm kind of wondering if the design of the upper house, the Senate, also reflects the design and function of the House of Lords, as well as any colonial or state constitutions that predate the U.S. Constitution. Well, actually, I, I'd go, I'd say it goes back further, this idea of bicameralism. I mean, um, uh, when you when you think about uh, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, um, they were articulating mixed government principles um, in the ancient world, I mean, Polybius, I think, probably is the best uh, person to articulate the need and ne necessity of 
uh, the demos, the aristocracy, as as well as uh, an executive. Um, it certainly is English. I mean, Harrington, in his work, Oceana, argues for mixed government. Um, um, so I think it it actually predates. Um, I think it actually predates uh, English uh, House of Lords, but uh, certainly our our system is uh, directly inheriting the British tradition. So, yeah, I, I'd say that it, bicameralism was overwhelmingly assumed to be the norm. I mean, only um, only Georgia and Pennsylvania opt for a unicameral system after the after the revolution. So bicameralism is the norm. Mixed government is the philosophical principle, which is our, uh, in more close to the founding period, Montesquieu articulates. But uh, I think there are some similarities. I mean, if we, if you, I think your question kind of is in the framework of you know how is it, how is our system similar and how is it different? So uh, on the similarity side of the T chart, um, there's certainly an American commitment to the the. Um, uh, what Aristotle laid out as the um, uh, the monarchical, the aristocratic, and the democratic. So there's the similarity there in our system that allows for an upper house, the Senate. Um, there's also, I think, uh, an inherited belief it's to some degree in what Americans would modify. It, it no longer is an aristocracy in terms of heredity, but natural. So I think we inherit that idea of an aristocracy from the House of Lords, but we modify it and we don't want a hereditary. Um, you know, all kinds of uh, folks in the founding period articulated the, the natural aristocracy. Adams most famously in some of his writings in the 1780s. Um, one of the things they also inherit it, that's similar is uh, the, the the secrecy principle. I mean, all over British history, there were times when uh, both commons and lords functioned in secrecy. We inherit that from state constitutional systems. We inherit that principle from the Articles of Confederation. Um, and the how the, when we have our, eventually have our constitution, the House publishes their proceedings. Um, they don't have to do on uh, on a daily basis, but the Senate uh, opts not to do that. So I think that, you know, in a weird way, uh, they inherit that, uh, you know, close the door to the public in the Senate. I think that's a very British, uh, very similar to state as well as British traditions. How they're different, I would say there's a radical difference in the upper house and our systems are elected. In the English system, they're appointed and they're hereditary. So uh, so they're elected and uh, there are terms. One of the big differences, and it really didn't dawn on me until I was I was reading a little bit about this in the last week. In the British tradition, as well as the colonial upper house tradition, the House of Lords and the upper houses in those time periods were support to the executive. Uh, I mean, you know they they were there to advise and um, and and really kind of be an arm of the executive. Well, in our system, the way I read the Constitution, is the Senate is a check. In a lot of ways, on the executive, and that I think is a a, a pronounced difference between the upper house and the British system. Um, the our our upper house checks them on appointments, or has a check on appointments. Uh, it has a check on treaties. So I think that's very different than the English system, uh, the role of the upper house. So th those are just a few of the, I mean, overall global similarities and differences as I see them from the British tradition. Well, can I ask you this? You said that you know, one of the differences is, is that our Senate will not be hereditary. Uh, and, that they will, <laughs> and that they will be, yeah, see, you, I think you know where I'm going. Oh, right? exactly. <laughs> okay. That in the, in, in, in the, the practical world <laughs> in which we inhabit, uh, it, it, from the 18th century, and, and I will, I guess, ask you to clarify when you say they're elected. It's not a popular election until the well, 17th well, century. Well, but they were still elected by the state houses. I mean, the state legislatures, they are elected. I, I mean, there's still a filtering and elitism there, aristocratic nature to that. But that was by design, I think. So, yeah, to your point about how it's evolved, I mean, it certainly has a lot of similarities to the House of Lords, definitely. But but on paper, the elective piece is, I think, a big difference from the British 
system. Yeah, I, I guess I understand it. I just I look at how it plays out in the nineteenth, and it, and even even today, you're not going to run for for the Senate, you know. And I know people like to point to. Uh, but to, listen to that word you use: run for the Senate. There's still there's still an elective component there, and I say that's a that's a significant difference. Well, and I, I that was probably a, a, a misuse of, of of a word on my behalf. You're not going to get appointed to the Senate unless you have a ton of money, uh, either backing you, uh, moneyed friends, and we know that in the late 19th century yeah. that the corporations, all yeah. right, really uh, are running the U.S. Senate in so many ways and we look did you at say, it today. did you say 100 years ago or did you are you talking about now is I, was, uh, I, I was i was <laughs> going to transition to that so okay you accept that 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 theoretical notion that okay yeah. it's not hereditary uh has been a little bit problematical uh in the sense that it is elitist uh it it, it is uh, uh predominantly a sure. class of people who uh, who represent the upper classes, and in fact, come from the upper classes. I forget how many millionaires reside in the Senate uh, these days. Some of them didn't didn't start in the Senate as millionaires, but somehow become millionaires or or such. Yeah, <laughs> I'm willing. Uh, I'm willing to leave the 18th century occasionally and and uh, read the news today. Yeah. Can we just say that there's more millionaires in the Senate than there are on this Zoom call right now? <laughs> yes, Safe to say. What? I think we could add full all four of our <laughs> our cumulative <laughs> wealth, and, uh, uh, and and we're not up there with uh, Senator. You know, sorry, but uh, I, my former Senator uh, Feinstein uh, there, I think forty something million dollars with her net worth or so. So, uh, Professor Kavanaugh, in Madison's Virginia plan of government, all right, the the plan that begins the debate, he has the Senate designed as proportional rather than equal. What experiences, thoughts, uh, influences led him to the conclusion that we would be best served by having proportional representation in both branches of government or of Congress? Well, don't forget uh, in the Virginia plan, um, membership in the House, the lower chamber would be based upon proportional representation. And then from that, uh, from that august body, uh, they would determine the upper chamber very similar to the British model. And I want to, for the students, if you're not familiar with um, the House of Lords and the House of Commons, understand the House of Commons isn't really common. So you're still getting there because of connection. So if you're going to delve into that, do a little research on that. Um, I think that, you know, you have to go back and take a look at um, the ideas that Madison is formulating his head before he writes the Virginia plan. Um, you, you take a look at, uh, he wrote in 76, uh, uh, what is it, 87, 86, he writes notes on ancient modern and modern confederacies. Yep. So he's, he's, he's ripping on that. Um, then he, uh, one of the a piece that I've alluded to that he came up with, I think in April of 87, 1787, uh, with vices of the American political system. Uh, I've alluded to that before, and I know that we've had uh, links on other episodes to that document. So he's laying that out. If you, if you, I'm going to put a, a link uh, in our resources too that contains this uh, hot links to these that I'm alluding to, as well as some letters. I mean, he's writing letters to Jefferson. He's writing letters to Randolph. He's writing letters to Washington. And you can see in these letters, um, these ideas that have been mulling around in his head. So you know, he's, he's thinking about this. And I think it's interesting too, to go back to... Um, his time in college because it was, uh, was it Witherspoon, Tim? Was it Witherspoon his instructor? Yeah, at Princeton, yeah. At Princeton. And um, the in influence of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, uh, there's a great book by Thomas Ricks called uh, First Principles or Founding Principles, where he takes a look at um, some important founding fathers, Madison being one of them, and looking at their early educations and their influences. So I think it's important to perhaps take a look at uh, what he's reading in college and the Scottish, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment, more so than perhaps uh, some of the English Enlightenment writers. I think those are very influential. But I think he's, you know, it goes back to what Tim had said. You know, what's in front of him is, you know, what he comes up with is what he knows. We're going to have a bicameral legislature. We're going to have a lower chamber based on proportion, which, of course, will give, you know, his home state of Virginia a little more juice, especially when you throw in the three-fifths clause. Um, and then, you know, from that, you will get uh, 
this natural, if you will, aristocracy. And by that time, there was an aristocracy in America, and especially in the South. There were, you know, the planter elite, as we call them. There was a natural aristocracy. And um, so I think he's, that's kind of his influences. I don't know if it answers your question, David. No, it does. But what I'm curious, like, so as far as state governments go, all right, that predate the U.S. the 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 U.S. Constitution of 1788. Are there? Do they have bicameralism for the most part, and are they uh, yeah. equal representation or proportional in their design? Well, I think as Tim alluded to, I think it was all but two um, have bicameralism, and you know you have a lower chamber that is you know very similar in regards to requirements that branch closer to the people, you know, and then you're going to have an upper chamber. That is going to be perhaps more moneyed or more aristocratic, if you and will. And there were and there were property requirements that were elevated to vote for the upper house too. So there's a built-in kind of aristocratic principle there for voting. And as I mean, those have been in place for what since you know 76, 1776. Um, and so when he gets around to writing the Virginia plan, which he's probably formulating, you know, he's probably formulating in 86, 87, you know, before he obviously before he gets to the convention. And uh, allows Randolph as governor of Virginia to, to put forth the Virginia plan. Um, well, I, I am curious what what powers under his Virginia plan. All right, we, we know that one of the bigger concerns by other states they is this you know is this proportional plan is going to give states like Virginia significant power relative to uh, you know some other less populous states, but. Are the powers, you know, uh, uh, that different between the upper and lower house uh, in his Virginia plan? Um, well, a lot of, so. Yeah, a lot of them's un, unspecified yet. I mean, that's early. That's May 29. So they have the rest of the summer to sort through the specific details of the powers of the ranches. But uh, to Chris's point about uh, there's a fast. Chris mentioned letters of Madison to various people. L look, the principle is he hates states. The vi the re Chris referenced the vices. He hates states. And in, in this one letter that Chris is referencing to Randolph, he's, uh, I think the quote is exactly, state sovereignty is incompatible with a national sphere. Incompatible. I mean, so proportional representation in both houses <laughs> would obliterate state sovereignty. So that that letter from Randolph, we'll put it, we'll put it in, the, uh, in the resources. That's a remarkable letter that he says that. Uh, and that's again to Chris's point before the convention. Oh, and, you, and you see, and you see uh, clearly the uh, when we've talked about it on other episodes, he, he favors the 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 negative over state yeah. laws. I mean, he tries to get that in the body of the Constitution. He tries. He even said that that he tried to get it in the Bill of Rights. I mean, he said that was his most important amendment was the the national negative, you know, the veto, the national veto over state laws. And so, man, that's like, oh. That's my guy. God, I love Madison uh, there. Uh, so, oh, well, curb your enthusiasm because there's enough to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I was talking to some students uh, earlier this week and they were asking me uh, somewhat about this. And I said, you know, well, we were talking about federalism. And I said, well, I, I've grown up a little bit over the last 10, 15 years. And I've come to realize that my initial views about, uh, uh, you know, about federalism uh, have changed because it's all it's all you know relative to the political context. I said right now in in this country at this time I'm I'm a big supporter of federalism and state sovereignty. Uh, <laughs> thank God for the state of California uh, kind of stuff. So you know I've changed a little bit uh, on that. So Professor Williams, um, th the question just begs a comparative uh, uh, analysis uh, here. It really does. Um, do most democratic republics slash democracies around the world one have bicameral systems uh, with and and two with one house being I guess more democratic than the other house? Uh, no, most most democratic countries are unicameral, and I think that's a function. I'll answer the first part first. I think that's a function of. The most populous countries in the world, democ democracies, are federal, and by being federal, there's usually there's always an upper house, right? It's always bicameral. Um, most countries in the world are not super populous, 
uh, as populous as the United States. So most are unicameral. So no, I think it's I think it's about a 60-40 split um, looking at both democracies. And then if you're just going to look at legislative systems around the world and ask if they're bicameral, it's still about a 60-40 split. 60 unicameral, 40 bicameral. Um, in terms of um, one other aspect, in terms of how the upper house is selected, um, about half are are uh, directly elected, which is what we do now after the 17th Amendment, obviously. It was, I would call it indirectly elected before that. About half are directly elected, and then the other half, actually it's a little more than half, are either indirectly elected or they're just appointed by um, the president, prime minister, um, something like that. So that's that's kind of a split. And then in terms of just how the re representation works out, the United States is uh, is unique. There's a couple other countries that have, um, I would call it malapportioned. <laughs> I would, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, it's like unequal representation. Um, Mexico and Brazil are the two that come to mind where it's, it's they're not quite as unequal. I know this is weird students because it's equal in terms of the senators. But when you think about in terms of, is it equal representation for my good friends in Alaska um, versus uh, my good friends in California? California is uh, very much getting the shorter end of that representation straw there. So it's I see it as unequal representation. Um, most most countries have it much more equal than we do, like France and Germany, for example. It's much more proportional is the other word to use. Um, in terms of powers, it's the same kind of thing. Um, it's kind of mixed, but like in Japan, for example, um, if there's a split between the upper and the lower house, then whatever the upper, whatever the lower house decides goes. So the upper house can't stop the process. Um, Brazil and Mexico, they can. Australia, they can sometimes. South Africa, they can sometimes. The sometimes usually comes down to, um, is it a law that directly affects states? In those cases, a lot of constitutions will give the upper house a say, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't involve state authority or state administrative functions, then the upper house doesn't have a doesn't have a say. So I hope that makes sense. I just didn't garble everything up. But are they more advisory to the executive uh, since they don't have that say? Are they more advisory in terms of the executive or not? Yeah, I wouldn't say. I would say they're advisory, Tim. I don't think they're advisory to the executive. I would say that they're probably advisory to their subnational units or whatever group that they are representing. Um, yeah, that's how I'd articulate that. Well, I, I guess I find it kind of interesting and maybe I don't know if you can explain to me why the balance is more unicameral given that one might argue that 19th century governing systems, the United States and England are, are two of the most influential both having bicameral systems uh, yeah. there, why the world and you know the kind of rejects that model in a majority way, as you put it. Yeah, I do think it has to do with um, the size of the country does matter. But I think the other thing, and this is just more of a hypothesis, I don't have any research backing this up. Um, for a lot of the English, think about the English colonies, the House of Lords for a lot of English colonies that get independence, that's not going to be a model, right? Because they're getting independence in the 1950s and the 60s and small d democracy actually means something. So that's, they don't really have something to adopt there. And I think also for a lot of places becoming democracies in the 20th century, maybe even late 19th century, um, there's a focus on getting stuff done. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> I mean, I know this is going to be crazy, students. I mean, you might want to cover your ears a little bit, but you might want to set up governments to actually do things rather <laughs> than just to stop things all the time. And I, I think that's part of the equation as well. I think definitely a lot of the former British colonies really felt like they were playing catch up de development wise. And so um, most of those leaders did not want to have a didn't want to have a second branch to deal with or a second chamber. They wanted to just get things done and and try to move the society along. I, I think that's what's going on. Yeah, and for those students that you know are wondering, you know, and questioning Professor Williams, there, I would just I would look at the filibuster. All right, a rule of the Senate. I mean, you can first of all, the Senate is designed, all right, to represent minority interests. 
all right, to protect from tyranny of the majority. Would you guys all agree with that? That that's one of the purposes is to is to is to calm down the passions and whims of the of the House of Representatives and and this you know and the majority populace. Assuming there are no political parties, I'll buy that. Well, that was uh, you sound a little bit like Washington there, David, in the cup and saucer analogy. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that early, early, very early on. So probably, yeah. yeah I think. Seen through the lens of the original Constitution before the Seventeenth Amendment, um, it's there to protect s- smaller states. I mean, it's a, it's right. So if you're talking about uh, the minority interest being Delaware, then or Rhode Island, I would say yes, yes. Right. Okay. So they, but it's already structured to do that. And then on top of it, you know, f- from the very early national period, they create this rule known as the filibuster. That just keeps piling on, and and what I'm trying to do, I guess, you know, Mike is is support your notion that you know, se- the, you know, the, the Senate is where you know good government goes to die. All right, if you look at good government as actually getting something done, because not only in its, its structure, but then in the rules it's allowed to create. All right, uh, it, they're protecting the minority within the minority within the minority. Uh, there, it seems to me, uh, when it comes to the principles of democratic government. Yeah, one more thing about that because I think this is my only opportunity. Um, <laughs> you know, well, because I mean, I think we're going to move on. I mean, we all show books, right? This book, How Democratic Is the American Constitution, it's kind of like Levinson's book, but I, I, I kind of liked all. Dahl's take. And Dahl makes this great point about the Senate. Like he he talks about all the undemocratic, uns, small d democratic institutions in the original constitution. And obviously the Senate's one of them. He sees it as undemocratic because two senators for each state. And he he at one point in the book, he kind of reflects and he says, if we were to create a constitution now and purposely create an undemocratic institution, because there was some interest that we thought needed to get special recognition, would it be territorial states would it not be an upper chamber maybe thinking about urban interests is one of his points or would it be you know certain marginalized identity groups in society there's lots of different ways you could imagine creating an undemocratic part of your government to serve an interest he just doesn't buy he doesn't think the states ever needed it and he definitely doesn't think in the 20th and 21st century that well, now it's not even doing that function anymore after the 17th Amendment. So anyways, I, I think that's a really interesting thing for students to think about. Like if you were going to have something that was going to have unequal representation, would you still choose a territorial state or would you choose some other entity? Like what would that be? So I just wanted to get that in. So, Professor Moore, I I apologize. I know you don't like questions like this, but it's just in in my nature. Uh, so there's this debate over proportional and equal representation, uh, and using the 200 years or so uh, of history as your guide, uh, who do you think was better at predicting, uh, you know, uh, the effectiveness of a Senate uh, uh, there? Uh, uh, as, as you know, within the confines of the debate, Madison or someone like Charles Pink, Pickney uh, uh, from uh, Philadelphia. Well, from that Philadelphia, is- I, uh, I'm i going to dismiss Philadelphia Convention outright because I don't think it, it matters that much. Um, I'm just going to go to the ratification debates because I think they're um, I think they're more important, frankly. So uh, I would say my my you know the answer if I reframe your question it's going to be anti federalists were more <laughs> accurate on how on how they would play this Senate out, um, and uh, I, I mean I'm sorry can I can I check for understanding because I I you know I know I should know this but uh, uh, you know uh, so the anti federalists were were opposed to the design of the Senate oh golly yeah um, they. Um, you know, in your opening remarks, it was uh, you went through Romney's uh, critique of the Senate. I'm thinking to myself, man, that's Cato five. Uh, Cato, his, his fifth essay goes, it goes to the issue of the elitist, out of touch, uh, remote, distant, too long. Uh, terms are too long. I mean, I, I think Cato five is one of the best anti-federalist writing. But there's there's a, I just jotted down these. You've got Cato five, Sentinel two, Brutus 16, Cincinnatus five. Uh, Melanchthon Smith's speech and a couple of speeches in the, in the uh, New York ratification. I think they all lay out the problems of the Senate. 
and uh, they're all uh, accusing it of being too elitist, too removed from the people. Um, the terms are too long. Um, they also are not happy with the blending with the executive. Uh, so, I, I mean, I look at, you know, I look at their criticisms in, in 88, 80, 87, 88, 89, and so much of the dysfunction um, or as well as just by nature, the aristocratic principles that people look at when they uh, that they conclude that the Senate is. I think the anti-federalists clearly are very prescient in their criticisms of the Senate. Well, I, well, well, I just let me, I wanna... let, me, let me jump in here for a second, David. I think because if, if, if the students look at the quote that, that is in the question from Mr. Madison, if they read a little further, they might see what he actually has to say, what he really feels about the Senate. And that is that we have departed from justice to conciliate the smaller states. Right. Like, OK, so that's how he really feels about the Senate. So even though he, he may be arguing in favor of this because he wants to get it ratified, yeah. uh, he is, you know, individually, Madison is not happy with the construction of the Senate. Right. And so I guess, you know, I'm going to just take this as the eighth grade understanding it is, uh, uh, Tim and Chris. And that is, as we just we talked about, that the Senate is designed to protect the states in many ways you know, especially smaller states from the national government, which was why I'm confused is because that's what the anti-federalists want, right? They want, you know, power remaining in the states. But your question and, is, from a federalist viewpoint, that's the sales pitch that the federalists give to the anti-federalists, and they say BS. Oh, okay. okay. It's not, it's not, I mean, blah, 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 okay. protection of the states. It's not gonna, it's gonna be an aristocratic group that's in cahoots with the executive. And uh, so your your question is framed around the federalist opinion of the Senate. The anti-federalists say, no, we're not buying it. We, we might call it the federalist sales job. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, was there any discussion about this this design? And, if, and, and again, going back to what Mike had said about, you know, things getting done, was there any talk about the efficiency of government under this design and and equal representation and and bicameralism and the and the things i mean well I'm this just... is where the anti-federalists talk out of the other side of their mouths because they're they're going to say great it's going to be inefficient and that means the states still have a role in their plenary powers at the state level so i mean there's not i mean the uh you you can't take the anti a lot of the anti-federalist argumentation is cherry picking uh, and not looking at the Constitution as a whole. So there, the so that's the other side of the mouth uh, out of the anti-federalists uh, of saying, "Great, the inefficiency is an opportunity for states to still exercise their sovereigns, their sovereignty." So, Professor Kavanaugh, by designing the Constitution in the way they do, with bicameralism, with different schemes of representation and varying powers, the framers were asking for and relying upon tension. All right. And friction as a governing principle. Uh, does that tension, in your opinion, still exist today between the House and the Senate? Uh, or is it more about political parties than those institutions? Um, I'm thinking of uh, Madison and Fed 51, you know, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. You know, you must give the power to the man or to the relates to the place. And I think he was relying on um, institutional uh, jealousy and institutional protections, you know, so the Senate would protect itself from the House, the House from the Senate, the Congress from the president in presidential encroachments. And then you've got the, uh, let's see, how can I say this, the uh, redheaded stepchild we'll call the Supreme Court. They're just going to be over there. Um, so, you know, there was this idea that there would be tension between the branches, you know, and again, the constitution is set up to des is designed to establish a limited government. So how are we going to limit government? We will limit it by putting in three branches that are not distinct, right? Back to Tim's, you know, the anti-federalist argument about the, the, the Senate being too close to the executive, um, you know, and, and Madison trying to explain, well, you guys don't understand Montesquieu anyway. Um, so we divide power that way, but of course we divide it between the states and the national government as well. Um, so it's designed to be limited and that tension should be there. 
Um, now, um, it is uh, party loyalty. Uh, I think it's party loyalty that drives the bus and party, you know, this party purity and these purity tests that you have for members of both the House and the Senate and even the executive office. Um, uh, there are so many litmus tests, it seems like, based upon party, not on the institution of the executive, the Senate or the House. So um, I've, I've used this quote before. Uh, Tom Mann, uh, Norm Morrissey's book is even worse than it looks. We have a uh, members uh, of the legislature, they're in a separation of powers government, but they're acting like they're in a parliamentary system. And that is because of loyalty to party. And a lot of that can be traced to the primary system that we have, uh, gerrymandering that we have, money in politics that we have. There are a lot of issues to consider. So I uh, would say we went from institutional jealousy to ambition being made to counteract ambition. Um, from Madison in Fed 51 to where we are today with, uh, well, currently seems to be a lot of dysfunction. Mike? Yeah, I agree with all that. I, I was just thinking of something. Um, I still think, I still think there's a social status thing between the two branches. I think most members of the house have a, like they want, they, they all want to be senators, just like every Senator thinks they, they can be a president. I, I think that's still alive. And, but I do have a story like um, in, I think it was 19, it must've been 1995. I was in law school. I was interning for Chuck Schumer. He was a representative and he was a representative at that point. And uh, I was there when we were working on the crime bill and we were there one night working and we were all in his office and the phone was ringing and different members were calling him and the secretary, whatever would say, Hey, so-and-so is calling. He's like, no, 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 I'm busy, busy, busy. He's talking, talking. And uh, Bill Bradley called and, we, <laughs> and he literally said, Oh, he looked at all of us because, you know, we're a bunch of like young interns in there. And he says, when the Senate calls or when a senator calls, you pick up. And so he picked up that call. And I just thought that was it was it was interesting that that kind of like um, blowing off members of his own party and members of the House. But when the Senate calls, it's like something special. I think that's still there. I think there's that sense that the Senate is is the more important branch to be in if you're going to be a member of Congress. Well, and, and let me jump in here real quickly with another story, because I always had the uh, fortune to sit down with uh, John Boehner when he was the House Majority Leader, not Speaker of the House, when he was House Majority Leader, and uh, spent a little time with him. And he said, you know, they're minus, and this is a quote, I, I remember this, because he said, there might as well be the Great Wall of China between the House and the Senate. <laughs> And it's like, wow, okay. And it just, the division. And part of it is that that natural aristocracy where I'm a senator and my, I think what happens is I think perhaps your uh, your uh, fecal matter takes on a little less odor uh, when you become a senator uh, as opposed to a House member. There's a, uh, you, to Chris's point earlier about uh, institutional tension or to your question, David, is it institutional tension or political party tension? There were two instances in very early in our uh, after Washington was elected. And in, in, uh, by the way, the Senate couldn't get a quorum. The House got a quorum before the Senate did. So they're always dragging their feet, even from the beginning. <laughs> uh, but in uh, Washington, in two instances, he is absolutely just livid with the Senate. One was uh, an appointment. Like he made this appointment and he fully expected the Senate to to confirm it like that day and uh and then he shows up in the senate and they basically say thank you very much now you can go uh i mean there's some institutional tension um <laughs> uh, and then the other one was um the very first treaty that our country mm -hmm. had was a native american treaty and uh again he he sends the treaty to the senate and fully expects them to ratify it right there and then and they say well thank you for turning it over we'll we'll get back to you so this and and by the way there's all federalists in the first congress <laughs> these are not the opposition party these are his it, party doesn't doesn't washington go with maps and other yep. things in that for that first treaty so he's yep. going there and he's like cuz you know going back to his surveyor days right yeah and they blow him off. I mean, and so he's like, and he's like, I'm never going back there. That's again. right. <laughs> this trip was an inconvenience. I think was the quote. With a quote. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering because of this. This tension seemed to 
therefore create a government that relies upon compromise. And that compromise is one of the virtues of being a representative. Would you guys all agree with that? Yes. Uh, well, uh, well, in theory, yes. And, uh, and, 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 and would you say that compromise is no longer seen as a virtue in our political culture? Uh, to the John Boehner, um, same thing. You you know, there was a 60 Minutes interview with him and said he will not compromise. It's like, well, you know, you're not going to get anything done if you're not willing to compromise. Politics, I, I teach this to my students, politics is compromise. When you have a, a body as large and as diverse as the United States Congress, House and Senate, you have to be able to compromise to move things through. If you're not willing to compromise, then you're going to be in the situation where we are. Look what happened. Look what happened to uh, McCarthy, uh, you know, in terms of the speakership when he had to reach out to Democrats to get funding to keep the government open. Compromise. Oh, whoops. We're going to vote you out. I, I, I do think I do think it's a, a principle that is not taken as seriously by either branch. And I think the branch. Well, OK, I think in the House we can accept it. If you're a minority in the House of Representatives, you literally have no power, really. As long as your party can stay unified, right? Um, <laughs> so you don't need compromise as much if you have party discipline in the House, right? Um, and again, the House is supposed to be that hot place, right? The hot, right? And the Senate is where I think you really rely upon compromise. Every senator can talk as you know as long as they want. There's not these rules. How many minutes? You you need that compromise. And I think one of the cultural shifts that's been happening in the last I don't know ten to fifteen years is this this kind of like the norms and practices of the house where it's like, I'm not going to compromise with you and I'm not going to talk. And it's an all out partisan war. Um, those, those folks are getting elected to the Senate now. And I think you're seeing more of that kind of um, that kind of practice in the Senate, which I think is relative. I mean, I don't know my history well enough. It seems like it's relatively new. Like it seemed like the Senate wasn't always like that. Um, the way it is today in terms of these senators coming from the house from that environment are bringing those practices with them well and i would agree with you that that compromise you know isn't as necessary with within the house but ultimately laws have to go to conference committee sure. and compromise has to exist within the leadership i would imagine of, of the House, uh, which is, I think, one of the current problems uh, that House leaders are having with their caucus. Uh, there is the, the inability of that caucus to, uh, caucus to understand that they don't get to make the law in and of themselves. They have to work with the Senate on that. So, Mike, uh, obviously things changed drastically in the early part of the 20th century, or, or maybe they didn't change drastically. I don't know. But but the progressives get a hold of uh, the reins of power, and we will get a 17th Amendment, uh, which uh, allows for the direct election of senators. In your opinion, did that undermine the whole you know, founding principles of the United States Senate as it was originally established? Uh, does it just destroy? I mean, does it really just kind of make the Senate, you know, uh, irrelevant? Not irrelevant. I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Like, yeah. I mean, I, well, it's interesting, right? Because if the students are tracing this argument, it's like the the main the main framer of the Constitution, Madison, didn't want anything to do with a Senate. <laughs> and, you know, as we kind of went through, but then he's arguing for the Senate because he's a good Federalist, right? He's going to get it through. And so then we get, he the, the way you justify the Senate, I think, in the document, in the original document is that, well, we have states and states need to be represented. We have this history of state sovereignty. All that's really, really real. And I think at the time, I think small states did have something to fear maybe from big states. So yeah, I think with the 17th Amendment, like if you think of the um, the Constitution as like um, a machine, right? And the, that the framers were thinking the machine was set up to work in a certain way, there's a certain balance. The role of the Senate in that balance changes dramatically once they do not have to go through state legislatures. They can go directly to the people um, and represent their parties more than they're representing their states. So I think that fundamentally changes how the Constitution was designed to work. Um, so I'd answer yes to that question. 
So wouldn't we be better served to go back and uh, have our senators uh, you know, elected by state legislators if indeed the purpose of the Senate is to represent state interests? I, I, you know, I, I can't make that argument. I'm, I'm too mad that <laughs> I, I've been thinking about this. I just can't. No. Oh, no. Why not? Because I really don't. I think now with the rise of political parties, I think it would just turn into... Um, it would just be the role of parties at the state level. I don't think, I don't think much would change given today's political climate. I really don't. I think mm. both parties have kind of, I don't, I don't think in this framework that the framers put together, I think they knew political parties were going to come about, but the mass kind of political parties with the small D democracy that we were going to develop. Um, I think, I, 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 yeah, I'm sure it's out there, but I think it would come down to some of the demographics uh, of states and their state legislatures. I mean, I, I'm 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 wondering do do would state legislatures have a more moderating impact on their senator versus the people directly, or do the people? I mean, I, I well, I, that's a that's a good reform proposal. Have the state legislatures pick one of the senators and have the have the people elect the other. Hey, there's an idea. Well, uh, I think it, it's interesting because if you think of the impetus for the 17th Amendment, uh, you know, and that was rampant corruption that existed. Uh, you know, see William Clark from Montana, for an example. Um, it seems like now uh, we just kind of bypass the state legislature and the money just goes right into the pocket of the senator from special interest groups. Right. So it's no longer, you know, no longer do you have to do, do you have to filter that cut through the state legislature. We could just go ahead and take that political action committee money and just put it right into the Senate campaign. We cut out the middleman. Well, what again? What what do you think about that? That that again? Well, that... I'm, I'm I'm actually listening to what you're saying, Dave, and it's like, huh? What if we went back to that? Because you know, I love the idea of the populist movement. And the direct election of senators, which is an increase in small d democracy, uh, and, and certainly with the issues that were happening at the turn of the century. But now, uh, you know, with the middleman, the state legislature is being cut out. Perhaps I don't. I'm not sure. I, I'm. You know, I'm not. I'm not as quickly to say. You know, no way, Jose. I'm thinking. Ah, I will. I, I will. I will tell you that if we allowed the state legislature of California to choose our senators they would be much farther left than they are, all right? Because our state legislature is is out there. I mean, it's pretty, it's out there uh, kind of thing. I don't know, Mike, you agree with that? Yeah, or, yeah. Now, I don't, I don't know about North Dakota or Wisconsin or Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 we're one way. The twig is only bent one way, so. So you're saying you're saying that that North Dakota senators are actually being elected by the people. It's a much more moderating, you know, f you know. Force no, goodness, no. There's nothing moderate about the people or our state legislature. Really? Yeah, Wisconsin. I, it might be interesting because the, uh, currently the the state legislature would pick uh, conservative, and the in the in the state of Wisconsin, it's anybody's guess what the people will. I mean, we're kind of purplish there. Yeah, therein lies the problem with gerrymandering at the state yeah. level, because now you have at the state level, you have groups in control that have, yeah. you know, and you can think of several states like Wisconsin, maybe perhaps North Carolina, Alabama, some other states that have maintained this minority type yeah. of control through gerrymandering. And if you allow them the ability to pick your senators, uh, the, that's uh, that's a little worrisome now. I'm, I'm going to I'm I, nah. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we've learned that uh, Professor Williams doesn't want to even get close to 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 that uh, uh, issue. I'm actually intrigued, and I, and I will say I'm really intrigued by Professor Moore's idea to have one elected by the state legislature and one senator elected uh, by the people. I, I think that'd be a really interesting reform uh, to to play around with and see if it changes the temperament. You know, and uh, you know, and the personality uh, of the Senate uh, there, or or our party's just so overwhelmingly powerful now, yeah. it doesn't matter at all. It seems that that uh, maybe that's what you're saying, Chris. Uh, yes. Uh, there. So uh, uh, we 
we've come to the uh, unfortunately the end of our hour together, and so as we are is our tradition, uh, we'll turn to our expert panels for some insight, recommendations, final thoughts uh, for you to think about when it comes to uh, Unit Four Question uh, Two and the U.S. Senate. Uh, Professor Kavanaugh. Um, I would tell students to take a look. There's, uh, there are some political scientists out here there these days that are talking about, uh, you know, the minority uh, control of government. And you've heard me rail about it on this program before. So I'm glad to see some people way smarter than me are actually writing things about that. Um, so don't be afraid to take a look into current scholarship uh, with that. Um, and as I've always, you know, um, told to or asked students to do is okay if, if if it ain't working how how would you fix it so think about how you would you know if you want to go after the system um how would you fix the system so make sure you're thinking about solutions as well professor moore and i i piggyback right on that to mike's point um you know maybe solutions are found in comparative analysis uh, I, I was fascinated when Mike went through all these variations that that, uh, that exist in the world. So to Chris's point, come up with solutions for the uh, to solve the dysfunction. And there's a there's got to be a, a a plethora of so, of those solutions when you look around the world uh, the way Mike has encouraged you to do. Professor Williams, um, I guess we haven't mentioned we haven't mentioned an aspect of the Senate that I just have the students think about. And that is the construction of the Senate and the relationship with the, the protection of slavery at the founding. I think that that's part of the story that we haven't talked about. I don't think it's the only part, but I think it's part of it that you need to consider. And then fast forward to the um, civil rights era, right? And I think doing some research and thinking about, even with senators being directly elected, the role that a few senators could play to literally stop um, civil rights legislation that was uh, a majority of the people said that they wanted. And and quite frankly, the role that that's happened recently with the state, and I'm sorry, in the Senate, with respect to um, gun control regulation, um, more recently um, when Obama tried to get that passed. I think having some of those examples and some of that history um, in your, in your notes would be good as you think about this question. And, you know, my thoughts are is one, I, I think you need to dig deep and, and make sure that you clearly articulate the original purpose of the Senate. Uh, and it is, is that purpose still in existence? And can we achieve that with the 17th amendment and I wouldn't hesitate to possibly make an argument that we might be better served, uh, uh, you know, by going back to the original design. I know that offends the small D democratic uh, culture that we live in, uh, but I, I do wonder if sometimes state legislatures might be a more moderating force uh, on, on the Senate there. Secondly, the quote is from Madison. Uh, and make sure that you have the context here, because if you have a judge like me, I'm going to go, well, wait a minute, Madison says this, but then he's the defender of it. But then in, you know, down the line, he says this, Madison's all over the place and make sure you're kind of always able to put, you know, you know, a quote by Madison in the context of its time and what's going on, uh, because he's kind of squirrely. And I don't know if that's the right word, Professor Moore, but uh, uh, Madison seems squirrely throughout his lifetime on on what his principles uh, are uh, uh, there. Uh, would you? Well, agree? some squirrels were taller than he was too, but <laughs> I think the technical word is squishy. Squishy, yeah, I mean. squirrely. Uh, okay, so I was just trying to add one to our vocabulary. Uh, more there. So hopefully uh, you've gained some insights and perspectives that'll help you out in your testimony. Uh, and when we see you next time, we're going to be going back. Uh, to the Federalist Papers, and we're going to be looking at Brutus 1 and Federalist 10 and the debate over factions. Uh, and so that should be a lively discussion. Until then, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Let's hope we have a Speaker of the House when we see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, Bonds. -bye, bye -bye.